Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is July 16th, 2023 in the year of our Lord. Welcome back to the Hotel Orloff here in historic Rural Retreat, Virginia. Um, it's a big, important day here. It's the fourth anniversary of when uh, the Hotel Orloff show began. When we began four years ago, we were living in another state. Uh, the world was very different, very different world. Um, but anyway, um, we're having a uh, big party today to celebrate. We'll be uh, going live here in about an hour and a half, doing uh, some kind of some kind of celebration that you might tune into, but. Uh, We'll be here. We'll be here most of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Right now I'm watching the Turning Point um, Action Show, Action Conference, whatever. So, so anyway, where did my drink go? I'm going to get my drink. Well, let's look at some fanzines, some uh, comic book fanzines and some that were more professionally done and um, probably shown them before, but, you know... We've probably forgotten everything, just like I do. Okay. Still trying to cut out sugar and soft drinks to try to um, reduce all these horrible things happening to me, but uh, I keep getting offered, here's a free Coke, do you want like <laughs> Stop giving me soft drinks. Yeah, when you shave your beard, you realize how much fat and horrid, monstrous uh, stuff is going on with your head. That's why it's probably important to grow the beard back so I won't be horrified every time I look in the mirror quite as much. Let's see. Let's get this thing. All right, we're ready to... Ready to go. This is the second day of this Turning Point Action Conference. Uh, yesterday they had Tucker Carlson and Trump talk, and it's highly entertaining. And they're right now it's about five minutes till eleven here at the Hotel Orloff. Um, I don't think the lighting's quite right, is it? Maybe that's better. This is non, this is just carbonated, but it's, there's no sugar, no. And I don't want to drink that diet stuff because that stuff they put in the diet drinks probably is even more lethal. All right, what do we got here? Oh, here's uh, the Wallace Wood Treasury. Is that light is too bright, isn't it? That's what I thought. Got to move it back a little bit. Thanks again for the amazing Hotel Orloff uh, t-shirt. Okay. Let's get this show on the road. Got a lot to do today. Okay. The Wallace Wood Treasury. Um, not in great condition. It's got a tear here. Um, you wonder why, why would there be a tear... This had to have been bought by a collector. I mean, who else would have bought a Wally Wood magazine but a collector? And, and why would there be a tear? I mean, that, this looks like it was owned by a little kid. It's kind of uh, mysterious. Um, this was a cover of Spaceman, Spaceman, 
which was a Warren magazine devoted to science fiction uh, movies. It was a companion to Famous Monsters of Filmland, and uh, it didn't last. Um, they also did, uh, James Warren also did a magazine called Screen Thrills Illustrated about old movies and movie serials, and then one called a Wild Westerns about Wild Westerns of the movie, something like that. And that was the Western version of Famous Monsters. And, and there was another one, wasn't there? Or was that it? I just found a, a copy of the Western one, which uh, what does that say on there? Oh, it says spine torn. Anyway, look at that uh, Marlon Brando painting. I bet that's about that's got to be a Basil Gogos painting. See, it looks just like Famous Monsters, except it's about westerns. It just didn't last. This is August of 1961. Uh, I think the tag, the uh, tag from uh, Duncanville Books, suburb of Dallas, uh, in, indicates that it is a uh, $5 book. But uh, let's see how badly this is torn. Um, I believe Harvey Kurtzman was the editor of this magazine. He worked for Warren a while and uh, most famously worked on a magazine called Help that was his... How badly is it torn? Oh, not too bad. Uh, well, yeah, it's torn. It's torn down past the first staple. It's got a Bonanza back cover. I was going to show you the Wally Woodbuck. I still will. I get distracted. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, Wildest Westerns. There's uh, one that uh, Kevin at Gotham City Comics just got. He's, it's not for sale. It's, he's keeping it in his personal collection uh, in this run that has a Jack Kirby, I'm sorry, a Jack Davis cover. And then there's another one in this series uh, that I wish I could get that has a Jack Davis cover of uh, John Wayne punching a guy out. That cover is uh, great. Um, but if you look inside, it looks very much like the layout of Famous Monsters. Let me see if I'm right about Harvey Kurtzman editing this. Okay. Let's see. Sam Sherman was the editor. Oh yeah, I think Harvey Kurtzman might have been the editor for a little bit, and I could be I could be completely wrong, but at this point, Sam Sherman, Sam Sherman, a big movie fan that also made some movies, like uh, The Immortal Dracula versus Frankenstein. He made that about seven years after, seven, eight year, years after he edited this particular issue. Um... Sam Sherman. Man, look, monsters appear here. Can you name this famous cowboy star? Turn the page. Why, it's Ray Crash Corrigan. Um, Yeah, that uh, 1958 movie, It, the Terror from Outer Space, this movie here, is uh, along with another movie called, uh, what was the other? There were two movies that were the primary influence for uh, Alien. It was uh, It, the Terror from Outer Space, uh, Man, what was the other one uh, where there were these uh, creatures growing inside this astronaut? It was called... Uh, I've got a little 8 millimeter, eight, super 8 millimeter uh, film of it. Um, it'll come to me later. Or I could go upstairs and look at my 8 millimeter collection and tell you. Anyway, 
Yeah, see, they, they're promoting famous monsters and then spacemen, which are the... Um, the famous monsters was the one that was the most successful and kept going for decades. That one started in the late 50s and lasted until the early 1980s. This wild, wildest westerns really only probably lasted about a year, um, maybe longer. Be careful putting it back in the bag since it's got that split spine. I'm gonna put this with my Warren magazines. Okay, let's look at the Wally Wood tre treasury. Yesterday, uh, on that Saturday morning comic book show, I think it's called Comic Book Memories, uh, Dr. Silver Age and Shannon hosted every Saturday morning. They asked, uh, what would, who would you put on, if there was a comic book, Mount Rushmore, who would you put on it? Uh, and I, and, and I, I said Alex Raymond because everything, all comics are based on Alex Raymond, and uh, Jack Kirby. I said Marie Severin and uh, Richard Corbin, and I was just naming people that came to my mind, and uh, then I saw in the chat that right before me. Uh, Spinnerack Studios had talked about honorable mention he would have given to Marie Severin. It's good that people are starting to acknowledge her influence, uh, her, her wonderfulness. Oh, I've got to change discs here. I'm recording this, uh, this conference on TV and um, it's... Hold on. Luckily, they're between speakers, and the, the I record on a DVD-R, and it records for six hours, and then I switch. Uh, but uh, anyway, then, you know, you think afterwards, you know, I saw someone else had put Wally Wood on there, and it's like, yeah, I should. There, you can't do it. You can't reduce it to four people. There's too many great, too many great uh, people. Um, oh, and uh, speaking of Gotham City Comics, um, he got a major, had a major buy of all these graphic novels, not typical graphic novels, but ones that reprint old comics, not, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, some of us on Wednesday night, like, pulled a few that we wanted to keep, but now... A guy came in yesterday morning and swooped in and bought the whole collection to send off to Singapore or Malaysia or somewhere where he goes and sells uh, the comics to GIs over there or somebody. So all of that's gone. Um, it's been several major buys that Kevin is getting all these people coming into a store selling amazing stuff. And then if you tune into the show, sometimes we'll do live streams and you can pick from the stuff before people come in and just buy it all up. So it's important to watch the show. Um, that's kind of like something uh, that who would have ever thought that you'd be able to get, get first picks from a store that's on the other side of the country. That's one good thing about the internet, I guess. Or a bad thing, depending on your state of your pocketbook but that's another thing is uh why are people coming in and selling all this great stuff because people can't afford to live right now because of this wonderful bidenomics so in a way it's kind of shame a shame um or you know Tell me now what I need to do. It's just, uh, it's the way it is, yeah. But Joe Biden, you know, he got 81 million votes, so, you know, um, he's just a great guy, man. Wow, what a genius. Not a criminal at all. That's right, that's right. Maybe, you know, you, you really have anxiety to what's going on in the world today. That's right. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, ladies and gentlemen. How does someone pick themselves up if they're not spiritually connected right now? 
how do they go about doing that? Well, there needs to be spiritual connection because we need to pray. We need to renew our faith. This is Sunday morning. We're celebrating the resurrection. And, and you know what? Jesus being risen from the dead means not just that we're working for victory, whether it's the you know, Save America, pro-life, or, or, or whatever else. We're working from victory. Victory's our starting point. Christ well, what's the thing is it's almost Christmas time. Scripture tells us he's in us. So if one is feeling depressed, maybe it's time to take a few steps back, renew that conviction of your faith, spend a little extra time in prayer, but then do something. The littlest thing. We can always do something to take one step forward. Don't worry about overcoming all the problems at once. You can't. But what little thing can I do today to make me feel that I'm making some progress, making some momentum? Because, and the other thing is, don't deal with it alone. I mean, thank, thank God, that's why people have RSVN. We have each other. I mean, we're not here just to be on the camera. We're here to join hands and hearts with each other. So reach out. Reach out to your local groups and, and, and conservative groups. Anyway, uh, churches. I've got a package coming from Gotham City Comics. Uh, should be here any day, and that'll be a great unveiling. Um, hold on one second. I've got things to do here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, one thing I must tell you is how great the artist Fletcher Hanks was. I, I probably should have put him on Mount Rushmore. I've got a book coming. Uh, about Fletcher Hanks. Okay, what is this thing called? Turning Point? And this starts with Trump's speech from yesterday. Trump. January. What is it? It's not January. July. It's June and January. July. It's not January and July. Jan July 16th, 2023. See? So I'm labeling the disc. Back to business, ladies. Where's my arm? Oh, there it is. All right. So. There is a line. There is a line. There is a line. There is a point at which they're going to dump Biden. I mean, we already see the signs of that happening. You know, they can't continue with this. Roger Stone was just on, saying that he predicts they're going to put up. Uh, what's his, uh, her name, her, um, uh, Michelle Obama. Which uh, Obama, remember Obama slipped a couple of times and called her Michael. I don't know why he did that. Anyway, supposedly she's going to run for president against Trump. We'll see. All right, Wally Wood. All right. Maybe that's too loud. What do you think, Liz? And they say, you can't do this without religion and morality. So, theocracy, no, that's not what we're looking for. But a people grounded in knowledge oh, that boy. there is a God and there is a right and a wrong way. Well, to oh, yeah, there's a correlation between having a God and having freedom. No Turn God, it down a little bit. You have no freedom. I've got, I think I've heard you say that. All right, well, let's get back to uh, business, ladies and gentlemen. The Wally Wood Treasury. When did this come out? I would imagine in the 1980s. Wally Wood was a brilliant artist. Um, but they are like looking for like we're ready for the battle. You know, bring it on. We are ready. And I mean, look at this too. art. There's a sense of confidence here, uh, but there's also a sense that you know we need. To but you see the Alex Raymond influence in Wally Wood. You, you gotta see. That all these guys, including the greats like Kirby and Wood, it all goes back to Alex Raymond. Now, where did Alex Raymond get it? From looking at paintings in museums? I don't know, but but if you follow things, oh, that's still too loud. I think they're louder when they're 
the speakers on the stage weren't as loud. It's like when they come and start talking. All right, come on. Down. Down sound. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Um, that's an illustration from TV Guide. I have that issue of TV Guide. Uh, I mean, uh, the guy that did the most illustrations from that group of EC artists was Jack Davis. He was all over TV Guide. But this is an interior illustration. It was in color in TV Guide. And what it's showing is the, in 1966, 67, especially the 67 season, I think that's when this, because of the, you know, the Batman TV show started on TV in Jan January of 1966, so it was such a big hit that by September of 66, the 66, 67 TV Saturday morning TV season, there were tons of superheroes chasing the, the funny animals away, is what that's uh, implying there. This is an illustration he did for the 1972 EC uh, uh, convention. EC lives. Um, That lives thing was kind of a catchphrase back then in fandom. Uh, people would wear buttons that said Frodo lives or John Carter lives or uh, whatever uh, area of fandom they were into. Spock lives. In this case, EC Comics lives. Of course, in 72, there was also the this two-page spread you can tell is is from mad magazine uh tales from the crypt the the uh 1972 uh, movie from amicus came out uh in 72 and then vault of horror followed that that's a cover from rocket blast comic collector these are sketches for the ugly stickers from tops um, it's just great stuff in Wally Wood. You know who Wally Wood is. This is the Wally Wood treasury. It's got, it's got like a checklist too. It's a cool thing. Here's, um, uh, his Heroes Incorporated. This was a self-published magazine from Wally Wood. So look at that. There's Marie Severin's name. Color covers the, the the on the cover the color schemes are by Marie Severin. So basically Marie Severin colored this and Marie Severin was behind the coloring in E C comics. And uh It seems like there was a comic-sized version of this and then this magazine-sized version of this. But Wally Wood started uh, capitalizing on the underground comic movement. In the late 60s, he put out a magazine called Wits End that was uh, his um, art. And then this... Oh, this is later. Um... This is from 1976. Um, yeah, Wally Wood is never, what is this? And then he has, uh, there's stories published by, uh, stories uh, by other people in here as well. Uh, he was still putting out Wits End in 1976 as well. Um, this one's drawn by Steve Ditko, and then it has uh, Wally Wood scripting and inking. But as I recall, um, 
this strip and and uh, Heroes Incorporated. They were they were really done for uh, to sell on military bases uh, to uh, like GIs. They were a little more gory than standard comic stuff. So I've got this in this fanzine box. Oh, this is uh, what Lauren Bobert. Let me turn her up. She and Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, recently got into a spat. They just didn't happen to have cameras in that room at the White House. All right. What do we got here? This is, uh, oh, these, uh, these came out in the 70s. These, uh, this is how they used to do facsimiles. They were these little, uh, well, this one isn't supposed to be a facsimile. What was the other one I just saw? This one. See, it's a Blackhawk comic, right? And they would do these. Um, but inside, it looks like a real bad photocopy. Like, uh, my dad used to have... Uh, after he retired from the army, he, he got into real estate and became a real estate broker. And he had this uh, Xerox machine in his office. This is kind of what the copies look like. They, they weren't very sharp. Uh, it just, this is not up to the standards that we're used to today. But it's all people had back then. And it, it's weird. I don't know. Is this supposed to be this way? What? Oh, this is 32. Yeah, this is this has got a problem. See, Blackhawk, right? And you see at the top, it's page 29, right? And then look, two blank pages for the center. And then you got page 32, so you're missing two pages. Isn't that nice? Of course, Wait, and then there's more missing pages? What? 33. Yeah, look, see, you got 33. Yeah, this is like a piece of uh, garbage, actually. I mean, it really is crappy. Because then you got two more blank pages, and, and you know. And, and what do you do, you know? I guess you could. Uh, Blackhawk. Wonderful facsimiles. So, and you complain about today's facsimiles. Uh, look at what people had to deal with back then. And this thing here, it it's the same kind of reproduction inside, maybe slightly better. I don't see blank pages though, thankfully. Uh, this is. Uh, anyway. How things have changed. This is a very much a uh, fan production. The Magic of Frank Frazetta. And yeah, I guess, you know, some of these are a little sloppy. I guess collectors weren't all neat. You know, you see some collectors at conventions and they've got mustard all over their shirts and um, so, you know, some collectors buy this stuff and they don't necessarily treat it that well. But this is filled with Frazetta sketches. Um, make sure they're all appropriate. There's John Carter with one of the four-armed Martian apes. Very accurate. The apes don't have hair on their bodies, just on their, the, the head. Um, I've read those books enough to know. Yes, yeah, so he's got it all accurate to the books when he's fighting the apes in the arena. There, uh, there's only see there like there's no hair. 
Um, there are the Martian lions. It's a Tarzan sketch. I think that was used on the cover of one of the Tarzan books. Man, the things they're getting away with putting on YouTube. Uh, it wasn't a year ago. This stuff, if you'd set it on YouTube, it would have... Uh, things are getting a little more lenient. Here's a um, really cool Jim Steranko cover. Let me get this out of the bag. This is one of these uh, indexes that came out, what was it, late 70s probably? Win 77. Wow. So this was, um, as each issue of the Fantastic Four and some information about it. It's basically what you would get on the internet now, but this is the way we used to have to get our information. And in a way, this is really better because it's permanent, it doesn't change, it doesn't get taken down. It doesn't get altered. The internet is very ephemeral, and but this this was a fan production, and uh, it goes back to uh, issue one, and it goes up to uh, probably it has Silver Surfer in the back. Let's see when it ends. It has the human, the short-lived Human Torch uh, reprint book. That was a fun book. It has the specials, the annuals here. Um, oh, it goes up to Fantastic Four 180. No, yeah, 180, 181, yeah, 180. That's about as far as it needs to go. I I don't think Fantastic Four after the seven, the late 70s is even worth it. I mean, I know John Byrne and everything had great art, but did he really do anything? Uh, I get people mad at me. I mean, he didn't really do anything, but I still resent him for having uh, Alicia start going out with the Human Torch. You know, I don't know what. That's that's not something. That's like uh, Lois Lane starts dating Jimmy Olsen or something. It, it's just not. I, I don't accept it, and also when he gave um, Johnny Storm like some stupid bowl haircut or some kind of new wave haircut, which I thought was uh, awful. But everyone says, no, John Byrne, that's the greatest era ever. It's like, okay, well, it, beautiful art. But to me, John Byrne wasn't the best writer. You know, John Byrne was great on the X-Men because he wasn't writing. All right, here's a Daredevil Index. It's the back cover. So it has Daredevil up to, um, yeah, this is basically the internet before, uh, oh, when this was done, Daredevil 181, this, was the latest uh, was the latest issue they went up to, and then it goes to the annuals, because this must have been early 80s. Uh, it also has uh, Black Panther in the back, which was a short run jungle action. The Marvel Adventure reprints of Daredevil. And it's in, in something like this that would tell you Things like, um, and if you pay one Biden five million dollars, you have to pay another Biden five million dollars. Yeah, it gives you all the, the information. Like, if they cut out panels when they reprinted the issue of Daredevil and Marvel Adventure, they'll tell you all the all of that stuff. Um, 
Quattrant is a an EC fanzine. And uh, one of the inside jokes that EC fans all know is that the aliens in the science fiction comics that EC put out, oftentimes they would speak in alien in alien language. A lot of times they would say squatrant, spafon. So that was uh, that's where the name of this comes from. There is a really great illustration. Um, the great thing about this, it's all about the artist. Um, I've got some of Frank Frazetta's Jungle comic strip. The artist, the writers, you've got interviews, whole section of Frank Frazetta. Um, some of the same kind of stuff you saw in that other book we just looked at. Boy, it's hot in here. Here's a, how Harvey Kurtzman did the, uh, rough for a cover of Two-Fisted Tales. Lots of um, cool, great stuff in here. And uh, this magazine would get even slick, would get slicker later on. It's just pictures of Frazetta and uh, Harold Foster and people. Let's see, when did this issue come out? This is, um, nineteen sixty-eight. Um, oh, this is cool. This is repro this reproduces the letterhead that. If you uh, for EC, if the, when they sent letters out, they would have this artwork on the side, and it just says this issue is dedicated to uh, Larry Stark. But if you were to photocopy this and get rid of that, you'd have a, basically EC stationery. You could not that anyone types anymore with a typewriter, but you put it in your printer, I guess. Or just scan it in. That's the way how people would do it now. What am I thinking? Oh. I this is issue number two, by the way. Um sometimes this stuff used to appear at half price books. And I, I don't know if they knew what it was, you know. They always look things up to see if things in the nostalgia section. Half Price Books is started in Dallas, which is near where I was. Um, but they have a, in other states. There's even one near me, about an hour away, but I've only been to it once. I wasn't impressed when I went into it. But it can always change based on what people bring in to sell. Um, so, uh, listen, they have great interviews and things. This is, uh, the publisher of this was Jerry Weist. Or perhaps that would be pronounced Weist. It's probably a German name. 1973 issue. Um, but this is definitely for collectors. It shows, you know, how the the roughs for the art and everything. That's that's a special issue. Yeah, whenever they cut from the people on the stage, it gets ridiculously loud. Of Roe vs. Wade. Right side broadcasting was created in 2015 by our commercial. Squatron. Make your own decision rather than force feeding you an agenda. We don't cut or edit um. or twist them. Okay. Who is this guy? 
I guess Ted Cruz is going to come on later. Who is this guy? <sighs> J.D. Vance. Senator J.D. Vance. I've heard of him. I don't remember who he is. Squatron 6. Oh, here's 7. Issue 7. It's getting, this issue just feels slicker. Um, this one came out in uh, 1977. Um, this beautiful artwork. Um, inside you've got, I mean, look at this, they're starting to put little, comic supplements in into it little little things like that it's uh and this is uh oh what have we got here oh it's um uh, okay so this is Roy Crinkle, one of the EC artists, was approached to do covers for Creepy and later Eerie. And these are his, uh, I guess they didn't use that. These must have been uh, what he was proposing to do. And I mean, I could read the article, but um, I haven't read this in years. These are covers that he proposed to do, and I guess they didn't use them. Of course, in the early, uh, they were, in the early days, Archie Goodwin was going and trying to get some of the EC artists to do covers for Creepy and Eerie. And here's more of his sketches. Um, Frazetta did a lot of covers for Creepy when it first started. Hmm. They're showing how this, this cover was swiped for this. They're just, uh, this is just meant for people that are really into EC. And I've always loved EC. Do I have many ECs? No, I never could afford them. Um, but, uh, it's something I dearly love. I mean, I've got reprints of almost everything EC ever did, but as far as original copies, I don't, don't have many. That's seven. Oh, here's uh, the next issue. Look at that wonderful cover. Um, look at that. The photos they'd send to fans where they dressed up as the the ghoul lunatics, which was their uh, their host of their horror comics. This was um, oh, this is issue five. I've got them out of order. This is from 1974. This has a Harvey Kurtzman. I didn't realize he did stuff for Sesame Street. You guys know that? Yeah, well, oh, I remember this one. Huh. That's how I learned to count to 18. Um, here they show the how they did the photo shoots for those photos. So, uh, So that's L. Feldstein, the young L. Feldstein, uh, and they're making him up. That's 
just great. These guys were so... Uh, because, uh, you see, the vault keeper, the old witch, and the crypt keeper, they knew what they were doing. I mean, they were... Um, they they were tapping in. They knew they had fans, and so they started a fan club. EC did and everything. They uh, then Stan Lee later um, tapped into that when uh, you know in the '60s with Marvel. Okay, so that's issue five. Let's put these in order. And I have a couple more Squatrons. This is a big, giant issue, thick, that has interviews with Elder, Feldstein, Gaines, and Kurtzman. So. Just... Just brilliant stuff. I need to get these out and just read them. Um, showing fanzines from back then. Um, yeah, so that's issue number. I think that says 83, 1983. This, this fluorescent ring light does horrible things to my eyes. My eyes are messed up already. Um, and then a science fiction issue with... Um, And then this, oh, look how nice this looks. Very nice production design on this magazine. Um, this is um, ish, This is from 1969. This is issue number. Uh, what number is this? I don't know. Um. Look at this, two-page spread, science fiction. Yeah. The back cover is very accurate to the novel, A Princess of Mars. starting to get real um, fancy with their production design. Um, look at John. Actually, this must be Tarzan on Mars that done by Reed Crandall. So Tarzan is splitting open the head of a Martian lion, which was called a Banff which George Lucas stole that uh, word and made it Bantha for the, for the elephants on Tatooine. Look at this Reed Crandall Flash Gordon illustration. Wonderful. I, I don't know. What are these things going for now? I'd have to look on mycomicshop.com. It's an Al Feldstein painting. Al Feldstein, Al Feldstein. I say it both ways. You get self-conscious when you're doing a show because you don't know... 
Am I pronouncing things wrong? This is near mint. Um, fanzine for students, fans, pros is the first issue. Um, great artwork. This has reprints of comic stories. Much better. Repro they're, they're reproduced much better than, than what we saw in those ones that were reprinting the Fawcett books. But... Uh, Oh, and they also have newspaper articles um, and clippings. It's like a scrapbook for cool people. Here's uh, illustrations Alex Toth did for... Uh, I always pronounced it Alex Toth, but I guess it's Toth. Um, but they're, they're for, uh, you know, obviously super friends. So that's called Near Mint, number one. What do we got here? This is a uh, Superheroes Monthly for foreigners. It's a foreign, I think it's from England. Because otherwise, monthly is obviously in English. Yes, it's black and white reprints of... Uh, American comics. See, a lot of Europeans got our our comics in in black and white, and uh, we're spoiled. Uh, you know those uh, black and white reprints of um, Marvel and DC comics that came out, where they called the essential this and. I forget what the other company called them, but anyway, they came out a few years back. They were thick books like phone books and reproduced lots and lots of comics really cheaply, but black and white art. Um, Kevin got tons of those books in that buy he made Wednesday or Tuesday, and a lot of kids would come in and, and they'd see the black and white 1960s Spider-Man books and they just say yeah and, and I mean I guess you really do want to see the color we're used to it but over in Europe they just they had to be happy with black and white reproductions um, but anyway this is uh, I guess this is from England let's see when this was done 1981 from uh, Egmont Publishing in London. Yeah, volume one, number nine, published monthly. That's what, how they got them. Uh, oh, speaking of DC Comics, here's uh, here's DC's Prozine. This was the official magazine that DC put out. I don't have many of these. They were showing these, uh, Shannon was showing these on the comic book uh, memory show on Saturday morning a few weeks ago. Wish I had more of them. This one I bought off the newsstand because they actually carried this at Lone Star Comics. Uh, a comic store that opened in the summer of 1977. And this is October of 1976. I think this is one of the very first purchases I made in the summer of 77 at One Star Comics, this was just there on the racks. And it's like, obviously that's an unpublished cover from Plop. There were a bunch of great Wally Wood illustrations they didn't use in the last few months of Plop. They just used these panels that look like rejected, uh, uh, I don't know. This is great because it's all about funny animals and like Fox and the Crow. And then they reprint, they. They have like these plop stories that uh, they never published in plop, like this parody of Jonah Hex that was uh, script John Albano, art Tony Di Di Zuniga. But um, I mean, it's like a, it's like a parody of Jonah Hex. They don't change Jonah Hex's name. They just call him Jonah Hex. They just do it 
I guess because they don't have to worry about being sued because they published Jonah Hex. This is a Steve Skeets, Steve Ditko, and Wally Woods story that never got published, I guess, because plot was canceled. And the only way you get the story is through this, uh, this magazine. Um, this um, Michael Fleischer Wonder Woman story. It's probably from his Wonder Woman encyclopedia. Um, Sugar and Spike. Um, so, is there? I think there's an interview with Sheldon Mayer in this issue, if I'm not mistaken. They have an article on the Bizarro World. Oh, there's look, because there's no price in the cover. Look, there's in pencil, a dollar fifty. That's what I paid for this. Um. Here's a special Joe Orlando issue. Now, Joe Orlando was one of the the EC guys, and he uh, he turned House of Mystery and House of Secrets and the unexpected into um, kind of EC style uh, horror comics in the late '60s, early '70s, with horror hosts and everything. Yeah, see these books. It's got a little bit of tape there for some reason. We're uh, let that come off. Probably. I don't want to mess with it. This is uh, some of these collectors didn't treat their books too well. It's got previews of upcoming uh, books. Um, this is <laughs> pretty. Uh, this is May, June, 1975. Okay, so uh, Marvel's Foom did the same thing. They they would show you the books that are coming that month or in the upcoming months. So you have Dean Bats of Danger Street is going to be in the first issue special. Everyone's talking about this new book called Danger Street where they... Um, have all the characters that appeared in first issue special all together? I, I haven't I haven't seen it. I haven't been in a store that carries new comics and man, probably um, almost a year and a half. Um, last comic store I went in, they didn't carry new comics. This. So yeah, that, you could reproduce a good poster from that. Um, see, the reason they reprint this EC story in here is Joe Orlando wrote that. Let me pause the commercial here. So, as soon as I finish this show, I'll start a live. Oh shoot! I'll start a live stream. Maybe. I don't know. Senator Josh Hawley. Where is he a senator from? Um, well, every day is, it seems like every day is historic, you know? It feels like it's 1940 or 40. One, you know, it was just kind of waiting. What's going to happen tomorrow? It's like, um, yeah, these, I remember these ads where they were promoting that Plop was coming. And all about Joe Orlando. Man, I, I, I got to read these books, man. I got to get back and read. Look at this. <laughs> this young Joe. Look at that, man. It looks like That looks like one of my uncles, or the pictures I've seen of my uncles back then. Oh. <sighs> Well, you get depressed. Look at these old books. It'll cheer you up. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I'm depressed. I'm kind of encouraged because I'm seeing the country waking up. And maybe enough people will wake up that 
criminals like this will never be able to weasel their way in for generations. I don't know. But if people don't wake up, then all that's going to happen is, um, is, you know, let's say Trump gets in for four years, then maybe another Democrat comes in, and they just, first day, they just change everything back. And it's like, unless the people wake up and demand... Uh, do away with all this nonsense. It's only temporary reprieves from the descent into Marxism. This looks like the last one I've got. I only have three copies of this uh, Amazing World of DC Comics. This reprints this. So you can make a color scan of this and type your name in there. Just like, And it would be just like you uh, are one of the, in the Superman Club. This certifies that, in this case, Bob Rosakis, this is his childhood thing, has been duly elected a member of this organization upon the pledge to do everything possible to increase his or her strength and courage, to aid the course of justice, to keep absolutely secret the Superman code, and to follow the announcements of the Superman of America in each issue of Action Comics and Superman. Uh, in witness of which I have this day set my seal and signature as follows. Look, Clark Kent's signature at the bottom. They should have made, uh, what's his face, Joe Biden read that when he was sworn in, and then maybe things would be okay. Um, and then this was the one that you would get if, when you joined the Junior Justice Society of America. And... Uh, Blah, blah, blah. Oh, this is Roy Thomas's <laughs> when he was 12. Or does it say 10? Oh, this light is doing numbers. On, oh, it's 10 years old. 10-year-old uh, Roy Thomas. This is his actual copy. It says, this certifies that Roy W. Thomas Jr., age 10 years. Oh, there's his address. We could look up his address can't read it right now. He was in Jack Jackson, Missouri. Is that where he's from? Has been duly accepted for membership in the Junior Justice Society of America upon the pledge to do everything possible to uphold the cause of justice, to obey the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Never be guilty of prejudice or discrimination against a fellow human being because of race, creed, or color. The membership is accept this membership is accepted by the above member uh, upon his or her promise to keep secret the JSA code and to follow the announcements of the Junior Justice Society of America in every issue of All-Star Comics. Oh, and it's Roy Thomas has signed it. And then the witness is Diana Prince. She's That's actually Diana Prince's signature. I hear my dog snoring, so I must be pretty boring today. You hear that? Oh, well. oh, man, that's depressing. There's the issue of, dang it, I can't find this book. I have this book. I, I got to have it. It has to be somewhere. I bought it off the rack when it was new. My copies looks brand new. But where the heck is it? It's just not there. It's been driving me crazy for a few years. So I just think I'm going to have to get another copy of it. The value of it isn't insanely high yet. But it's almost worth it for me to pay that amount just to stop tormenting myself about it. Um, oh, there's got a whole article on Adam Strange. Every issue of this has got amazing stuff in it. That's just, that's why it's called The Amazing World. <laughs> I t I, I, I've watched a couple of these shows that I do. I tend to use the word amazing a lot. And, uh, so I gotta watch that. Um, yeah, that's just great stuff. I don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm showing you these, and then, <laughs> then I will have competition buying them 
because you guys are going to be looking for them. This is the one I got when I got my uh, Foom membership kit. Came in an envelope with the Hulk's head on it. I still have that envelope somewhere. Uh, and I think this was inside the envelope, but I don't know why that has an X on it. I guess because this was not mailed in the mail. It was sent inside the en envelope. And then you got a subscription to Foam. This is when Tigra first appeared, which as a kid I called her Tigra because I didn't, I didn't ever hear, I didn't think, oh, I guess it should be Tigra. She's like a tiger, I didn't think. Anyway, this is summer of 1974, and this is, this is another book that's kind of hard to, uh, kind of expensive. Uh, but, uh, honestly, the DC one probably looks a little more professional. Except the early issues of this were designed by Jim Steranko, and those ones look very slick. But I got in on it a little bit late, and uh, after Jim, the ones that Jim Steranko designed are, are, are very expensive. But there's some great illustrations, you know, that you could. Uh, I mean, what I what I used to do is I would photocopy like a page like this, or a page like that, and then you can hand them out, and kids can color them. They're they're like great coloring pages. Um, anyway, it shows upcoming books like the DC one do, did. Uh, I don't know I, I, if this one started first and then DC started theirs. I think that's the way it was. I remember this. This kid sends in a picture of his bedroom and he's painted the Green Goblin on the slanted ceiling there. I remember looking at that as a kid and, you know, thinking, wow. Um. Foom. Okay, so the next issue of Foom that I got in the mail is issue 7 from fall of 1974, and that would have been when, um, um, that would have been when I was starting fourth grade. And that would have been the address uh, where I was living. One, uh, 10502 Portrait Portrait Court, San Antonio, Texas. Um, there's the Code of the Beast. There's some Murray Severin art. Here's um, the Marvel staff playing baseball. Let's see who these people are. This uh, Glennis Wynn, or possibly Wine, um, she later was the uh, editor of the uh, Warren uh, Comics line. Archie Goodwin was the editor in the 60s, and then it was, uh, oh man, his name's on the tip of my tongue in the 70s, and then she took over in the maybe late 70s and early 80s, something like that. Let's see. There's Jack Abel. I think he worked for DC too, didn't he? I think that's the one that's uh, related to Howard Stern. He's like Howard Stern's cousin or something. 